It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. You're listening to us in your neighborhood, from coast to coast, and around the world. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Joan Herman, author, speaker, and your host. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life brings you interviews with some of the most inspirational and influential people in the world. It's our goal to educate and empower you so you can live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. We have another great show for you today. Joining me today is supermodel Emmy, who's here to talk about how we can feel beautiful and empowered no matter what our shape or size. Emmy has appeared on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, Good Morning America, Insider Access Hollywood, The Today Show, and more. She's a regular contributor to the Huffington Post and the author of three books. Welcome, Emmy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Joan. What a very lovely introduction. Thank you. I mean, when I was doing research for this show, I, I came across a quote on your website, when the student is ready, the teacher comes. Mm. And I also add to that being relevant to my life, the greatest teacher needs to learn the lessons the most. And I think that your life has been a wonderful example of these two quotes, these sayings, mm, these mantras. Mm. So how have you survived so many major life challenges? I mean, in recent years, you survived lymphatic cancer, divorce. These are two things that alter someone's life forever. Mm. So where did you find the strength to get through these challenges? Well, I'm, I, I definitely, um, I do a lot of prayer. I do, I meditate very regularly. I know that if I don't, um, I'm kind of untethered. And so I get a lot of inspiration. I get a lot of peace by trying not to be in control and knowing that what is in front of me is exactly as it should be. That, you know, when I hear certain quotes from other people that have gone through hard times, it, it just allows me to perhaps be upset in the moment and let it out um, and get up and angry and then let it go. Because if I hold on to it, then I sink. You know, I mean, let's back up a little bit and let's talk about your career as a supermodel. When did you begin and what has that been like for you? Well, you don't wake up feeling like you're a supermodel. You, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, um, I it's wish kind we of did. A, a title that's been bestowed <laughs> upon me. It's fun. It's great. You know, I'm glad this lifetime I, I have uh, the title of a uh, supermodel. It's really lovely, though, mm -hmm. I, I say in jest. I, it's really lovely to be um, a part of a, a the first of um, breaking through the barrier of beauty and uh, taking a firm stand, having a background as an athlete, and seeing and understanding that the body in all its shapes and forms, first and foremost, is unique to, uh, to ourself. And we need, to, in order to be fruitful, it's almost that we have to start from the home, the self, uh, in order to feel unique and to feel that we are deserving of whatever greatness comes our way because we're all really, truly uh, able to tap into that. When we're feeling less than, when we feel that the other person outside of ourself has better, that's when we're always playing the catch up and we never ever will feel empowered. So being an athlete almost built within me the power and the strength and the understanding of what my body can do in leaps and bounds in fast times or, or in strength. And so I felt like I had an advantage going into this industry, this curvy industry that had a, almost like a shroud of shame back in the late 80s, early 90s of like, oh, she's the other kind of uh, beautiful or not, they weren't mm -hmm. really saying beautiful. So I had, to sh I had to kind of stand firmly and stand proudly amidst the, all the learning curve that was going on and not exactly the most welcoming arms within the industry of saying, oh, okay, I guess they're there. And then you start looking at the research that 68 million women are above a size 12. Yes, that includes some of the unhealthy, but it does show that a majority of women fall within this, this percentage. So instead of making these women feel less than and insignificant, it's better to accept and to embrace all of us, whether we're size zero or whether we're size 20-something, and say, okay, 
you're significant in your existence. Now it's up to us individually to take care of our health. And from there, you'll grow and prosper and have the life that you're meant to have without this other part of, of living where it's like, oh, I shouldn't exist. I'm a decide, you know, I'm bigger than the, the ideal. And it's a whole waste of time. It, it truly is. I mean, I recently received a fashion catalog in the mail, and they were showing plus-size fashions on women that I would say were a size 12. And I really took offense to that because I'm looking at them and I'm saying, but this is not a plus-size woman. Do you think Madison Avenue is finally getting the message? Joan, it's a great question, and I'm giggling. The only not at you, Mm -hmm. but I'm giggling because when I first started the industry, there was plus size fashions in catalogs that were shown on size six and size four women. Yeah. And so in the years, we're finally starting to see women that are with the, you know, and it's becoming more normalized, which is really, really very good for our own eye as a general mass public to say size 12 is really not plus size. But when back when, back in the late 80s, early 90s, if you saw a girl that was a size 12 or a 14, in a catalog, you'd be like, horror, Mm -hmm. can you believe this? And now it's becoming more understood, which is a good step in the right direction. I think what you're saying is, wouldn't it be great to be able to get a catalog and see us as women being reflected in the magazine? Now, with modeling, it's, you know, I'm 5'11", and I represent size-wise a majority of American women, but when you see me, I'm 5'11", and I'm wearing a 14, 16, and a lot of women say, you don't look plus size. And I'm like, I'm a, I represent the plus size industry. Being fit and trained at a size 14, 16, as a, you know, 5'11", it's almost like when you see women who are representing the straight size industry at size 0 and 2, and they're 5'11", and they're extremely thin. It's it's way the, the clothes hang and, and all that. So I don't know if we're ever going to have... Um, models that are size 24, 26, because, and we're working on trying to not only have size zero models, we're Mm -hmm. trying to get them higher in size to be a little bit more normalized and less extreme. And I think that's going to be healthier for all women, even women who are thinner, see those images as the ones to go for, the prepubescent images of, of beauty that is highly unattainable. Emmy, you work with a lot of women. Do you think that we're becoming more accepting of ourselves if we're not a size four or six? Are we getting the message? You know, Joan, I think despite all the the negativity you see online in some of the comments when you see plus size stories or stories of diversified beauty, um, there's still some hatred out there. However, there's so much more empowerment. There's so many more other television stations and news organizations and newspapers and media that want to show and highlight the diverse beauty that's out there for the health of women. It's become a very, very big issue. Take a look at the Today Show. They just dedicated uh, their website as well as a full program on showing the anchors without makeup and talking to individual, every single anchor talked about their growing up and their body image. So it's on the radar of the mass public because everyone wants to feel better about themselves and they're seeing research shows that if children don't feel good within their bodies within themselves they don't achieve they don't go for their dreams we have the most important national resource it's our intelligence intellectual property and it starts with the children if they're not feeling good they're not going to prosper and and contribute so it's a very 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 big problem if we keep showing one single idea of a male image of handsome and beautiful and and cool, one singular ideal of a female image, when we're born diverse, we're born with race, we're born with, with shape and age, and if you push all the society into a corner, you get disordered eating and thinking and feeling and living, and that's not good for the society as a whole. I mean, a few years ago, you heard the words, you have cancer. What did that diagnosis do to your life? It's, it's hard to even put words to what it did in my life. I'm going to attempt. It turned it upside down like a very full purse. And it shook, shook, shook. So all the sand on the bottom, all the makeup pieces got taken out. And you had an empty purse. And I had to choose what I wanted to put back into it. And 
it was a process that was extremely hard and very, very difficult. I didn't understand that with each item that I put in, there were some that I had to take out again because I realized that it wasn't quality driven and it wasn't something that was going to uh, benefit my life or others in my life, that it was just there from a past childhood situation. I had to take it out and go, oh, I guess I don't need you anymore. Um, I had to clear house with certain friends um, that I thought were my friends. And it's it was not like a pointing the finger. It just, I had to do that to know where my support system was. And people had to do that with me, I'm sure, that they could not handle that. So it was like a, a relationship clearing, a, um, a an emotional, a spiritual connection. I never meditated before cancer, never. And I was told time and time and time again to slow down and sit. I was like, my God, what, you must be kidding me. Well, it's one of the most important things that I do in my day every day. So to say that it, it was bad and, and, you know, that I had to have chemicals run through my veins and all that stuff, it was really yucky and disgusting and horrible, and I don't wish it on anyone. But it knocked on my door because the student was ready for the lessons. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the most important time in my life that uh, I, I don't want to have to learn my lessons the hard way, but I certainly was stubborn. I certainly wasn't listening, and I'm not saying that all cancers and bad things happen because you're not listening. It was my time to learn quickly, immediately, to slow down and listen, and to take really good care of myself. Emmy, from these life lessons, what would you say to someone who's going through a transition or a crisis that seems like it's too much to bear? Uh, to bring yourself back into the present moment. Because what you're what you're thinking in the in the future, what you're projecting fear of what, the unknown is really unknown. It's not happening. So the only thing that you can really control is how you're going to react now and how you're living right here and right now. And you have to really have faith that tomorrow is going to come and you'll be able to handle that. And sometimes you even have to break it down hour to hour because there's such incredible stresses in life. You, you really only have this very present moment. And when you break down, whether it's relationships, whether it's financial, whether it's uh, – and living, in, living in truth, not being in denial. If you're spending too much money and you're in financial ruin, you've got to seriously get yourself together, get help, and, and sit down and get back on a budget. If you're in serious problems with a relationship and you know it's not good and you're being beaten, well – the present moment says, how badly do you feel? And do you want to feel any more pain in this relationship? You might need to pick up your bootstraps and get your family out away from a situation immediately. And there's help there instead of thinking, oh, it's going to be better in denial. With health, if you're feeling badly about being too thin or being too large, ask yourself why you're denying yourself good health. Really be real, real, real. And not to follow anyone else's image not to follow what what the other person looks like, has better, greener grass on their ground. It's always looking in, in your own life, what can I do right now that's going to be beneficial for me, myself, my family, and be able to handle the, the stresses and the strains that are going to be taken and take it step by step by step because tomorrow comes and it's not what you're projecting out there. It's not what you are. Fear does the worst derailing. And if you could be more, why, if you have 50-50 chance of either having fear 50% of the time or joy for 50% of the time, I always choose joy. Knowing that there's all these really bad things that can happen, but I'm going to just try and keep a smile on my face. Not in denial, but try and keep a smile on my face because if I have a choice between the 50-50 of the d hard disgusting horrible feeling of like scared and being fearful versus I'm gonna be happy right now because this is all I have and I'm gonna be happy going through some hard times thank yeah. you so much for being here with us today this is such a powerful message we are beautiful no matter what we look like externally and I'm so happy that you are here today if our listeners would like to get more information, you can visit her website, emmynation.com. That's E-M-M-E, nation.com. Again, Emmy, thank you so much for being here with us. 
Oh, my pleasure. I, I look so forward to, to chatting with you again. And if you feel like you ever want to jump on our cruise next year, it's emmycruise.com as well. We'll be right back. It's time for Medical Minutes. Joining me today is Dr. Michael Gross, the Medical Director of the Active Center for Health and Wellness, the founder of Active Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, and the Orthopedic Director of Sports Medicine at Hackensack University Medical Center in Hackensack, New Jersey. Dr. Gross is the author of the new book, Get Well Soon. Welcome, Dr. Gross. Thanks for joining us today. Joan, thank you for having me. Dr. Gross, you're an orthopedic surgeon. What would you say from your practice are some of the most common injuries that you see in youth athletes today? Well, I think it's important to realize that children are not small adults. So even though we may see the same injuries, ankle injuries, knee injuries, shoulder injuries, the mechanism of injury is not necessarily the same. So in adults, we may see traumatic injuries. Patients fall down, they, they collide with other athletes, and they hurt themselves. A lot of the injuries in kids are overuse injuries. Do you think that that's a, a bigger problem today? I remember years ago when we were younger, kids played football in the, in the fall, they did basketball in the winter, they did baseball in the spring, so they were using different joints and different muscles throughout the year. Today you may have someone who's playing baseball all year long. They do summer ball, fall ball, train in the winter, spring ball. Is that what's happening today? Well, I, I think you have two subsets of problems. And I'm going to get back to the problem you identified, but I think a bigger problem is that kids are not active enough. So they're sitting home, they're playing video games, they're doing activities on their computer, they're, they're doing indoor things. They don't get outdoors enough to just play. And so a lot of kids are not physically fit. And then when they do go out and do things, they're suddenly going zero to 60 in three seconds and they get injured. So one strategy is kids need to be more active. They need to get out and, and spend an hour a day outdoors just playing and doing things. And that doesn't necessarily have to be an organized sports, but some sort of physical activity to keep them fit. Let's go back to what you were talking about. Yeah, kids are spending a lot of time. There's another group of kids that are spending a lot of time in organized sports, and they may be overdoing it. They may be not only playing that sport all year round, but spending eight hours a day playing that sport. They're, they're, pl they're competing on a baseball team or two or three baseball teams in the same season. Then they're going to their pitching coach and their hitting coach. So they're really not giving themselves that time to recover after exercise. And overuse injuries occur when you're doing too much too quickly and not giving your body the opportunity to rest. There are two different subsets, but they both lead to injury. In the second example, do you find that that ends careers much earlier than it should? I do. I think a lot of kids get injured before they ever meet their potential, and these injuries are career-ending. The other problem that occurs is that kids have a small injury, and they keep trying to play through it, and small injuries become big injuries, and then they become career-enders. So one of the things I always tell kids in my office is it's better to, to lose a few days and let an injury get better than to lose a whole season because the injury has now sidelined you. Doctor, with all of the pressure that are on these athletes today to excel, to, as I said, if you're playing baseball, they almost expect you to play fall ball, to train with a pitching coach or a catching coach. So what would you say to a parent to help avoid these injuries when there's so much external pressure? Well, I think that you hit the nail on the head there. That pressure comes from the parents. And I think in a lot of cases, these parents have unreal expectations about what, what the result of the sports participation is going to bring them. They all expect that their kids are going to become professional athletes and get that big contract. And quite frankly, that's not going to happen with 99% of the kids that, that are playing sports. And so pushing them that hard, number one, takes away their joy and they learn not to even love the sport that they're playing and they probably give it up just because it's too much pressure and it leads to injuries. So one of the things I always like to tell kids in my office when I see an injured kid 
is I like to remind them why they're playing that sport, whether it's baseball, football, whether they're running track, playing soccer. They're out there to have fun. And I try to remind them, and if you're hurt, are you really having fun? And the kids get that right away, and they say, all right, well, let me get better, and I'll go back out and have fun. Sometimes the parents miss the point. And I think understanding the long-term consequences is what should separate adults from kids. The kids always, oh, I have to play next week. This is the most important game of my career. It's the most important day of my life. And it is. A 15-year-old hasn't done that many things. So it may be the most important day in their life, but it doesn't mean it's the most important day for the rest of their life. So sometimes we have to remind them as adults, let this thing get better so you can do more important things in the future. The parents have to remember the consequences and they have to teach that to their kids. They can't kind of buy into the other thing, which is, oh, my kid's a senior, it's his last day. They have to remember they're the adults in these conversations. Dr. Gross, thank you so much for spending time with us today. If our listeners would like to get more information, you can visit his website, activeorthopedics.com. And if you'd like to learn more about achieving true wellness in your life, get a copy of Dr. Gross's book, Get Well Soon, which is available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Thank you again, Dr. Gross. Thank you, Joan. Nutrition is the foundation of good health. What about your pet? Do you take the time to be sure his nutritional needs are being met? Hi, I'm Dr. Mia Frezzo, a veterinarian and founder of the Animal Hospital of Hasbrook Heights. I combine holistic and traditional medical care for your pets. Feed your pet a high quality diet in which the first ingredient is a protein, such as chicken, beef, lamb, fish, or soy, and in which all of the ingredients are recognizable in comparison to a list of unpronounceable chemicals. Beyond these basics, you may look for phrases such as human grade, no byproducts, and organic to indicate the degree of quality of the pet food. A recent surge of grain-free diets have arrived on the market. Grain-free formulas are ideal for pets with known food allergies. Some pets with digestive issues, skin sensitivities, or seasonal allergies may also benefit from a grain-free diet. An added benefit of a high-quality pet food is evident in the yard or litter box. A high-quality, digestible diet, one without fillers, produces less fecal matter. Although a high-quality diet may cost more initially, most pets eat less, since every bite is full of good, digestible nutrition. Now that you have chosen a brand, do you select canned or dry? For dogs, I generally recommend dry formulas. It may be helpful to moisten the food with warm water to facilitate digestion, especially in large breed dogs. Cats, on the other hand, maintain their weight and protect their kidneys better with canned food. Feed your pet well. We all strive to give our pets the longest, healthiest lives possible. I'm Dr. Mia Frezzo. For more information, visit vetinheights.com. As a beautiful child come into the life of your family, I'm Dr. Michael Magwood, a chiropractor specializing in pediatric chiropractic. A lot of families have wondered, when is the best time to get my child checked? Some people don't know. Some people say, we wait till they're hurt. The International Chiropractic Pediatric Association, of which I am a member, is continually doing research to show ideal times for children to be checked. Research has shown that a tremendous amount of birth traumas go undetected and untreated. The pediatric chiropractor has a very important role to check children for structural and spinal deviations right from birth. Other important times for evaluating your child are as they first have the strength to hold their head up, as they first begin to crawl, and obviously as they begin walking with the tremendous number of falls that they'll experience. The basic stresses on the child's body that we assume to be normal often cause spinal deviations and at a young age are the easiest to correct. The chiropractors trained in pediatric techniques have entirely gentle approaches to care. In fact, the adjustment for an infant is as simple as a touch with a baby finger. If you're looking for a natural approach to team up with your pediatric physician, visit me at our Pure Balance Center and schedule a no-charge consultation and check up with your child. You can reach me at 973-773-8244 or visit our center's website at Pure balancecenter.com. I'm Dr. Michael Magwood. We all want to live a happy, productive life, but sometimes we just need a little help. Our Coach on Call experts provide strategies to help you live your best life now. Joining me today is Louis Soto, Jr., 
a transformational life coach and author of the book, Awaken to the Brand New You, The Path to Reinventing Oneself. Lewis is a motivational speaker and founder of New Life Living. Welcome, Lewis. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me on the show, Joan. I'm really happy to be here. Lewis, often we hear the word spirituality, but sometimes people confuse that with religion. What does spirituality mean? Spirituality means to really connect deeper to the meaning that the person has of God. So, Lewis, what are the challenges of having a spiritual practice? Challenges of having a spiritual practice is that it's really hard to practice what you preach. For instance, if the sermon that you just listened to this past Sunday was talking about forgiveness and you have a hard time letting go of grudges from someone that really hurt us in the past, then we're not really practicing the true meaning of spirituality. So how does someone implement a spiritual practice in their life? The best way is to really start to develop some type of mindfulness and contemplation practices. So if a person has been thinking about taking a yoga class or starting a meditation or maybe going to a Bible study, this will start to nurture their spirit and they'll start connecting deeper to their spirit and their soul. And in your opinion, how does that impact all areas of that person's life? It will impact in a tremendous way because they will start to develop the attributes of spirit, which is love, joy, peace, gratitude, and harmony with oneself. Lewis, thank you so much for being here with us today. If you'd like to get more information about Lewis, you can visit his website, newlifeliving.org, and be sure to pick up a copy of his book, Awaken to the Brand New You, The Path to Reinventing Oneself. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided are the opinions of our guests and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on the site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, take part in the book club, and be sure to follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.